Good evening, everyone. My name is Dave Kasovich, and welcome tonight uh, to our celebration of 10 years of faithful partnership with our churches. My name is Dave Kasovich, and I have the honor of serving as the head of school. And it's a joy to have you with us tonight. Tonight is about you. You as the churches and parishes that have been supporting us for 10 faithful years. Tonight is a celebration and we're so overjoyed that you're with us. There are so many of you with us that unfortunately you notice that you are muted. But please uh, use the chat to message each other, to say hello, to make some comments. I also have a few other housekeeping things for you. So please keep your video on so you can see who's here, fellow parishioners, folks from across the state, friends across the country. So welcome to this special anniversary celebration. A little preview of tonight. As you know, we have the presiding bishop with us, Bishop Michael Curry, and we are so excited to have him here with us. We are tonight celebrating over 160 churches that, it, that have supported us in some form or fashion since t our founding. We're also going to engage with our students and our chaplain, Father Andrew Kellner, and they're gonna have a little conversation with Bishop Curry, so stay tuned for that. And lastly, please stay to the bitter end because we have some special news to share with you about the future of St. James. As I shared with you earlier, we have a lot of folks with us tonight. This is our biggest event we've ever had at St. James School. And it took a lot to get Bishop Michael Curry here tonight. And I know that is the number one reason you're here. And the number two, I hope, is to celebrate our 10 years. But it took a lot to get Bishop Michael Curry. In fact, it took five bishops to get him here. And I wanna to tonight thank those bishops. First, Bishop Rodney Michael, Bishop Alan Bartlett, Bishop Edward Lee, Bishop Dan Daniels, and our own bishop the here in the Episcopal Diocese of Pennsylvania, Bishop Daniel Gutierrez. Thank you, bishops, for encouraging Bishop Curry to be with us tonight. So as we begin, let us begin with prayer and let us remember that we are in God's presence. I'd like to have the Reverend Frank Allen, our board chair, lead us in prayer. Frank? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gifts and challenges of the day that has passed and for calling us together tonight to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the founding of St. James School. Thank you for raising up visionaries to begin the school and for the hundreds of faithful partners who have offered their gifts and themselves to grow the school so that these children of yours may take up their place in your world. We thank you for our students and graduates and for their families. We thank you for the surrounding community that has offered their support through the years. We thank you for the teachers and staff and volunteers who are so deeply committed to our mission. Watch over us all in your grace and peace. Tonight, we thank you for our presiding Bishop Michael, for his grace and vision and energy, his leadership and love, and for our own Bishop Daniel, who has been our faithful support and partner along the way. Send your spirit upon us and among us this night as we celebrate, and may you continue to empower us as we move forward in the coming decades. All this we ask through the love of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hi, my name is Sean Smith, and I am a fifth grader at St. James School. I love wrestling, and when I grow up, I want to be a football player. Thank you for joining us tonight. Did you all know that St. James School was founded by a church? Yes, St. Mark's Church in Santa City. Did you know over 160 churches have been involved over these last 10 years? Isn't that amazing? So, as a way to celebrate our church partners, please enjoy this video. Thank you for the school supplies and the food that you blessed St. James with. 
And thank you for the wonderful teachers. You bless me to help me learn every day and make me smile. Thank you for giving food to the welcome table. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for believing that Black Lives Matter. Thank you for keeping our community safe. helping our school. Thank you, church partners. We love you. Thank you for helping St. James School. Thank you for collecting school supplies. of our Zoom tutors. Happy 10th anniversary. Helping our school. Thank you, church partners. We love you.
Thank you for believing in us. Hello, I'm back. Hope you remember my name. Because it's St. James School 10th anniversary, I'm going to share 10 awesome facts about Bishop Michael Curry. Number 10. Bishop Curry is the first black presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Number 9. His favorite ice cream flavor is butter pecan. My favorite is vanilla with sprinkles. Number 8. One of his favorite jobs before he became bishop was school chaplain at the Bethany School in Ohio. Number 7. His favorite teacher in middle school was Miss Lenny. She was a great teacher who told stories while teaching math. Number six, Bishop Curry is both a dog and a cat person. He has a cat named Claire. His wife is allowing him to get a dog when he retires and he cannot wait. Number five, in middle school, Bishop Curry's hardest subject was math. I honestly love math myself. Number four, Bishop Curry says when he is frustrated, his grounding technique is to slow down, sit, and close his eyes. Number three, Bishop Curry has two daughters and several grandchildren. He loves time with his family, and he loves to cook for them, especially at Thanksgiving. I hope Bishop Curry likes mac and cheese. Number two, his favorite church hymn is Balm in Gilead. He also likes, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands. You can also tell I like that one too. Finally, number one. Before becoming a bishop, Bishop Curry lived in a few different places, including Ohio, North Carolina, and Baltimore, Maryland. Guess what the name of his church was in Baltimore? St. James Church. Please welcome the legend himself, Bishop Michael Curry. I say, I don't think I'm the legend. I think Deshaun is the legend. <laughs> Deshaun, thank you. That was incredible. And uh, <laughs> you are why this matters. And, and you are why all of these 160 church partners and all of the folk who make St. James School possible and all of that um, lobbying firm of bishops. Uh, I haven't been so successfully lobbied, I don't think for anything in my entire life. And I said, I've got to be there. In fact, it started when Bishop Daniel Gutierrez brought me to St. James School. I can't remember, it was about a year or two ago, I've forgotten now, but uh, we just came by and did a quick visit. I didn't know he already had something in mind, um, but I can certainly see why. Deshaun, thank you. and and to all who have participated to make this possible and everyone who makes this, this remarkable school possible. I thank you. And on behalf of all of your brothers, sisters and siblings who are the Episcopal Church, wherever they may be, I bring you their greetings and assure you we thank God for you and pray God's continued blessing on you and the work that you do for these children and young people and frankly, for us all in our world. Let me just say a few things and then we'll get on with the, with the program. And, I, and, I, and I'll keep this brief, but I have to begin. There is a, I mean, you all know that um, early in the gospel, certainly in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, and then at the very end of, of John, uh, there are these conversations between Jesus and Peter and some of the um, other apostles, disciples, where he says something like, follow me. He says it at the end of John's gospel to Simon Peter. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he says it at the very beginning to Peter, Andrew, James, and John. He says, follow me in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Which was a way of saying, follow me, and I will make you more than what you would be simply on your own. Follow me, and I will show you a life of, of integrity, a life of dignity, a life of courage, a life that will not be easy. Follow me, and I will show you a life that will make a difference. 
a difference for you, a difference for the world. Follow me and I will show you a way of love that is the way of life and that can liberate us all to live as God has dreamed and intended when God first said, let there be anything. Follow me. A couple of years ago, there was a movie that came out that I never saw. And so I'm not commending it to you, but I saw the trailer. I'm, I like, I'm one of these people who likes to troll on YouTube just to kind of see what's on and um, because it's free. But anyway, I troll on, on YouTube and uh, a trailer uh, popped up a couple of years ago for a movie called Son of Man. Um, and it was a movie about the life of Jesus. And again, I have to tell you, I never, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, the trailer didn't entice me to see it, but the trailer was tremendous. Um, the trailer focused on, um, it was kind of a conflation of those various stories where Jesus calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John, sort of that, those first followers, um, and, and, and shows Jesus and Peter in a boat. And, and Peter is fishing and he's not catching anything. And, and Peter's clearly frustrated. And Jesus finally says to him, look, put, out, put your nets out into the deep, which that story actually is found in Luke. And so Peter does what Jesus says in frustration, just kind of throws the nets out into the deep over the side of the boat. And then the next scene that you see is from under the water. The camera goes underneath the water and it's looking up. And what you see above the water is the face of Jesus reflected in the water. And then Jesus touches the water and there's a commotion. That part's Hollywood, but nonetheless, he touches the water and there's the commotion. And then the next scene, you see Peter and some of the other disciples pulling in this incredible catch of fish, so much so they can't handle it. Jesus then comes along and, and says to them, now follow me. And Peter has this look on his face like, we're finally catching fish and you want us to go somewhere else? <laughs> and he says, what do you mean follow you? Why do we have to follow you now? What's the point of it? We got the fish. Follow me and change the world. following Jesus of Nazareth, his teachings, his example, daring to live in his spirit and his way of love is not simply about us as individuals, though it is about us. It is about this world in which we live, that this following in the way of Jesus is about changing this world from the nightmare it often is and often can be into something closer to the dream of God for the beloved community, where as the old slaves used to say, there's plenty good room for all of God's children. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. Follow me and I will make you more than you ever thought or dreamed you ever could be. Follow me and in partnership with your God and with each other, you will do more than you could ever ask or imagine. Follow me and change the world. When I saw those images of all of the partner churches and communities that have come together to make St. James School possible, when I saw those marvelous young people, those children, when I heard their voices, when I heard them speak with such articulateness, such clarity, with such pride, I said, you may not realize it, but you are following Jesus and you're already changing the world. One student, one child at a time. And the truth is, that's the only way the world has ever changed. There's another story in the Bible. This one in the Hebrew scriptures. It was a time when children's lives were in jeopardy and in danger. It was during a time when Hebrew people were slaves in Egypt. And the Pharaoh of Egypt had decreed 
that Hebrew baby boys, when born, should be executed. And there was, there was a woman who had a baby boy. And she made a little basket, a boat, an ark, if you will, and put it on the Nile River and put her baby in the basket. And the baby floated down the Nile and his big sister Miriam followed to make sure nothing happened. And as it would so happen, the daughter of the Pharaoh of Egypt who had enslaved the Hebrews, she saw the baby and responded to the need of the baby and took the baby up and took him into her own home and adopted that child as her own and raised him as a prince of Egypt so that he would learn the arts of military science, the arts of political strategy. Little did she know that the child that she saved would one day save a whole people from slavery. And the Bible says he even saved her. The child you save today may save us all tomorrow. You have already begun following Jesus and changing the world one child, one Deshaun, one little boy, one little girl at a time. And who knows, but that one day those children will save us. I'm going to stop now because you got more program. But let me tell you another quick story. You know, the definition of a pre of an optimist is someone who believes that when a preacher says, and in conclusion, that that actually means they're finished. But but I really am. My father, who, who was an Episcopal priest, now gone on to glory, um, um, had a massive stroke years ago. And he was outside in Buffalo, New York in the winter, shoveling snow, which he wasn't supposed to be doing anyway. Anyway, he fell. And fortunately, he fell and his head was lying in snow um, when, when the neighbors found or saw him um, and got the EMT folk there. And the snow sort of cushioned his head. It actually kept it cold, um, which, which helped. Um, and he recovered somewhat from the stroke, um, not completely, but somewhat. But anyway, he um, had fell out and it was actually the postal person who, who found him and he didn't have his wallet on him or anything. And they got the EMTs there. Nobody else was home or anything. And none of the na actual neighbors were home who knew him. Anyway, they took him to the hospital and didn't know who he was. Uh, but anyway, they were treating him at, at the Erie County Medical Center. And one of the nurses came in and recognized him and said, that's Father Curry. And later I met her. She was a kid who had been part of the community center at St. Philip's Episcopal Church many years before. She was now one of the nurses who attended him when he couldn't help himself. Follow me, Jesus says. And you'll do things you never imagined. One child at a time. Thank you, St. James. And God bless you. Amen. And now, St. James has a special presentation, a video featuring three parishes and the impact this remarkable partnership has had on St. James School and on them. Our partnership with St. James School has given our church the opportunity to work with uh, a community really different than ours. 
I think about the ways you can answer God's call to help and love your neighbor. And for me, working with St. James and the community at St. James is a really important way because we're helping improve the educational opportunities of children, which I just think is so critical. It's a place where from Center City you can go, it's not far, right, but you can go and uh, to a different place and give and serve in some way. For a lot of people, the ability to like physically go somewhere and serve and know that's an ongoing mission, not just a one-time, you know, week-long, you know, mission trip somewhere, uh, has been very meaningful and a way to have a sustained giving and, and way to serve over a long period of time. Engaging with St. James School has allowed folks at St. Martin's to step out of the confines of Chestnut Hill um, to develop relationships with students and teachers as well as other volunteers. And I really feel that that connection is a living reminder for us to continue to strive toward beloved community. I would really encourage um, faith communities to come down for a visit. It's such a, a way to see exactly what they're doing day to day and also hear about their vision for the future. I went to an Episcopal school in Honduras when my parents were missionaries there and the school itself was a, a mission school and uh, it was a, a very influential time in my life and has benefited me tremendously so I've always felt like I wanted to be able to give back in a similar way and so being involved in the school has allowed me to do that and uh, see kids benefit from an Episcopal education like I got. After a few years here, I have so many memories from the family style hot lunch at St. James School that served daily to the 5K from MLK Service Day to the welcome table. I feel like what stands out for me about St. James School is the sense of joyful community that they bring to every single thing they do. Well, every day I learn something new when I come down here about the community. So there, are, I have lots of memories about it, but you know, one sticks out when I think about it. Um, and that was the day that Derek Pitts came to visit our school. Derek Pitts is the chief astronomer for the Franklin Institute. And he's a distinguished and nationally recognized African-American scientist. So when he walked into the classroom, it was so exciting to see him there and to be such a great role model for them. He took them outside. He was back here in the yard back here doing a lesson on planetary distances. And they were running back and forth, measuring how far the Earth would be from, you know, Mars in, in terms of relative distances. And then they went inside and did a, a hands-on activity on meteor impact craters. Every single day, and I mean every single day, St. James School engages in the important work of breaking the cycle of poverty through education, and they do it with their whole hearts. Giving of your time, talent, and treasure will help the school, but it's going to enrich you as well. Good evening, Bishop Curry, and good evening to all our church guests who are here. My name is Father Andrew Kellner. I serve as the chaplain here at St. James School, and we have four of our students here with us tonight who have some questions for you. And we're gonna start with some introductions, and we're gonna start with Bryn at the very end down here. Hi, I'm Bernby Smith. I'm a proud student of St. James School. I'm in the sixth grade, and one interesting fact about St. James is that we have four different houses, Patientia, Industria, Benevolentia, and Humilitas. Oh. Hi, my name is London. I'm in the seventh grade and something interesting about St. James School is that the church is actually turning 175 years old today. Well, oh, wow. well this year. Hi, my name is Sean Smith. And one interesting fact about St. James is that we have all lady chickens, no men. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Randy Brown and um, <laughs> so great. One interesting fact about St. James is that we have a basketball team and we were champions in the church league two years ago. Oh, wow. Excellent. So Bishop Curry, we want to get started and ask you some questions first about your childhood, if that's all right. And so sure. we're going to start with Brent again, and she's got a question about your family, actually. Uh -huh. Bishop, Bishop Curry, was your family religious? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, my daddy was an Episcopal priest. Um, and, um, uh, you know, so that, that pretty much guaranteed us at least going to church and, um, and we did, and we were pretty religious. And then the rest of my family, um, were mostly Baptists and Pentecostals. Um, and, um, my grandma who, who, uh, kind of moved in when I got to about middle school, grandma was a dyed in wool rock rib, North Carolina Baptist. Um, yeah, I was surrounded by a lot of religious folk. They, they were everywhere. <laughs> 
So Deshaun, you want to follow up with your question? Yes. Bishop Curry, who were the most important people in your life when you were a child? Well, my family, um, in particular, but my family and uh, my, you know, father, mother, and and grandmother. Um, they and then, of course, my sister. And uh, but I was really surrounded by a lovely family, um, and uh, they really were important in my whole life. And and then I had I had uh, I mentioned you mentioned uh, Miss Lenny in the fifth grade. I just loved Miss Lenny. She was she was just I don't know why I just was loved her. Loved fifth grade. I didn't particularly like fractions, but she helped me to learn to like them. And uh, it, uh, I was in fifth grade in 1963. I remember that. It was in 1963. And uh, so she was an influence on me and she probably didn't even know it, I suspect, uh, way back when I was in fifth grade. And I'm 67 years old now. I was, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Except Randy, you want to follow up with your question? Bishop Curry, I'm an acolyte at St. James. Um, what was your first leadership in the church? Mm. Well, I was an acolyte when I was your age. Um, I guess it probably would have been getting, you know, you had to like uh, uh, be an acolyte long enough to kind of get uh, what, what I think they call in Congress seniority um, so that you sort of uh, over time, you know, became different stages. And um, once I was in charge of the younger acolytes, now that I think about it, I guess that was my very first kind of leadership um, experience in the church or probably in life, now that I think about it. Excellent. L London. Um, Bishop Curry, um, when you what if you could go back in time and give your 12 year old self some advice, what would you give? Hmm. Whoa. You know what? Don't forget to dream. Langston Hughes has a poem that says, hold fast to dreams for life without dreams is like a bird with a broken wing that cannot fly. But with a dream, it can soar. Hold fast to dreams. Thank you. Excellent, thank you for that, Bishop Gray. That's fantastic. Uh, we have some questions now about just being the presiding bishop. Uh, we we pray for you all the time when we have mass, Michael, our presiding bishop, but we don't necessarily, sometimes we pronounce it wrong. We have, uh, presiding is a little bit of a hard word for the fourth graders, but we get we get there in the end. Uh, Deshaun, you want to ask your question first? Yes. Bishop Curry, what does a presiding bishop do? That's a very good question. <laughs> well, the, the one thing that presiding bishop do is I get to, uh, well, before COVID, travel around the, the country and actually um, around parts of the world, and I go and make other bishops. That's part of that's probably my first thing that I do. And I remember being in Philadelphia um, some years ago when um, a, all of us came together and we ordained and consecrated Bishop Daniel Gutierrez, your bishop as a bishop. And that's one of the things that I do. I travel around and make bishops. In fact, before the pandemic started, I had gone to Taiwan uh, to go and um, ordain the new bishop there, um, and Bishop Chong, and came back to the United States and then left and went to Cuba uh, because we welcomed the Episcopal Diocese of Cuba back into the Episcopal Church. And then I came back home the beginning of March and was getting ready to go to the House of Bishops meeting. Bishop Daniel would have been there and all of us would have been there. And then the pandemic set in. And I've been here at home in Raleigh, North Carolina, doing the work of an Episcopal bishop on a camera in my in what used to be my oldest daughter's room. Um, and so now I make visits around the church and meet with the clergy in the different dioceses. I just do it by Zoom now. And I haven't traveled to make new bishops. We've had to redo how we do that. And we had the local bishops do that at socially distance with their mask on without a big congregation there, um, just the required number of witnesses. And then the congregation is all on Zoom and, and everybody watches it. So I go to all of those. I've gone and sat in the congregation and, and watched and met with the clergy, but that's what the presiding bishop does. I used to say I get on airplanes pretty much every day. Well, that's a great segue into Randy's question for you, Bishop. Um, bishop Curry, how many churches have you visited as presiding bishop? 
Oh gosh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Be honest, I don't know the answer to that. Um, well, well, I figure I've been presiding bishop now. What five years, bishop? I guess it's, is it, it is five years. Yeah, five years. Um, and you figure, except for the summer, I would have been in a church every some church every Sunday in a different part of. Uh, the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church is actually in 17 different countries, if you count the continental U.S. And so um, I have to visit every diocese, not every church, but every diocese. But on the Sundays, I'm in a church, just a normal, regular church um, uh, when I make those visits. So you probably figure there are about 30 of those a year. Uh, you have to do the math, multiply that times five, and um, you'll probably get close to a approximate number. I don't know what that would come out to five times 30 is. What what would that be? 150 or so? Yeah. Did, I, did I get my rat, math right? Did you get it right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <right>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would be happy. <laughs> Excellent. Bryn, why don't you take us with our next question? Bishop Curry, why did you choose to become a presiding bishop? Well, I, you know, it's it's funny. I actually didn't choose it. The bishop shows that the way we get our presiding bishops is that there's a nominating committee and a nominating process, and you have to say you, you want to be considered. Um, but then it really is the bishops of the church who come together, and um, and they, they lock us in. We were in St. Mark's Cathedral in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're basically locked in there until we until we elect someone. Um, and, and so we say our prayers, sing hymns, um, vote and, and, and keep voting until someone finally um, gets the majority of the bishops. And uh, so that, that's really how it happened. Um, a friend of mine talked me into letting my name go forward and be considered. Um, I'll, I'll actually tell you, it was the Bishop of New York. Um, we were, uh, the House of Bishops met in Taiwan and uh, he pulled me aside and, he, and asked, have you really, have you thought about um, letting your name be considered for presiding bishop? And I said, I thought about it, but I'm not sure I wanted to. And he said, do it, just do it and see what happens. You got, you're not going to lose anything. Do it and see what happens. And so I took his advice and did, and now here I am. Excellent, Bishop. Thank you. London. Um, bishop Curry, as as the presiding bishop, you talk a lot about love. What does love um, mean to you as your role? You know, it really, I really believe that um, at the heart of Jesus and his teachings, every, what he was trying to get us to understand over and over again is that love for God and love for our neighbor and for ourselves, um, love God, love your neighbor and love yourself, that that's the key to living a life that's not just self-centered, but that actually cares about others as well as yourself. Um, and that if human beings learn how to do that, we can make a better world out of this place. We can actually do it. And so I really believe that that's at the heart of it. And I say that everywhere I go. Um, about a month ago, I was, well, I was here, but we had a little prayer service for members of, of the House and Senate on the United States Congress. And I do that once or twice a year uh, with a group of them. And then we have some prayer time at, we do morning prayer. And then after that, we have some prayer time. And I talk to them about that um, and say, you guys need to love each other, um, even when you disagree with each other. Um, and uh, so keep praying for them because they have a hard job to do. And um, the more they love looking out for the good and the well-being of others as well as the self, They'll look out for all of us. And so I preach that same message everywhere I go. Bishop Gutierrez has heard me tell the bishop, I'm a one note Charlie. I got one message and I'm gonna keep going until I retire. And even then I'll keep going. <laughs> Excellent, Bishop. Well, we wanna give you some time to ask our students some questions too, but we want one last question from Deshaun and then we'll give you a chance to ask them some questions. Bishop Curry, what is one thing you told your daughters when they were my age, and why did you think it was important? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I, I used to tell them a story uh, that, that, well, it was a story about when I was, uh, I was pro probably 12 or 13, I'm not sure. And I don't know what I had said to cause my father to say this, uh, but at one point, um, 
he just kind of blurted out and said to me, he said, you know, the Lord didn't put you here just to consume oxygen. And I think what he was getting there, you're here to consume oxygen. Y'all know about photosynthesis yet? Does that, I, mean, I don't know if they teach that. No, you do know about, oh, you do. Okay. Now, in case the adults may not know about photosynthesis, let's go over that quickly. Um, photosynthesis is about plants, right? And the plants take in what? Oh, better yet, what do we take in? What do we breathe? Oxygen. Ah, we inhale or breathe oxygen, and then we exhale what? Anybody know? Carbon dioxide. You got it. We exhale the carbon dioxide. And the plants, all, all animals, all mammals, all do that. We inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide. Believe it or not, and you all know this, but we're just letting the adults know in case they forgotten when they were, did their biology in school, that all of the plants, trees and flowers and, and all of the plants all over the world, all over the creation, they take in the carbon dioxide that we give and then they do what? They release oxygen. We give them what they need. They give us what we need. I don't know if my daddy was thinking about that when he said, you know, the Lord didn't put you here just to consume the oxygen, but he did put you here partially to consume the oxygen, but he also put you here to give out carbon dioxide, to give the plants and the world what it needs and you receive what you need. God put us all here. I, and my daughters would tell you, they heard me say this, God put you here to give as well as to receive, to love as well as to be loved to do what is just and kind, as well as to be done justly and kind to. That's why we're all here. And my daughters would tell you, oh yeah, we used to hear that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Do you have some questions for our students this evening? Sure. Well, okay, I've got, I've got two. Uh, one question, um, a fun one, and the other one's um, a really serious one. The serious one that I'm gonna let you think about is, I bet everybody here would love to know what you would like to be when you grow up. You don't have to answer that yet. Cause let's do the fun one first. Anybody a football fan? Uh, oh, you pointed at this guy. Who's your team? I got Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay? Oh, you're happy then. You had a good season. <laughs> <laughs> Who's yours? Mine's is the 49ers, but the Eagles when they're actually doing good. <laughs> I understand that. That you can be flexible. And that, that's a good way to do it. And same. same thing for you. Yeah, that's true. And then how about what you all have you got a favorite sport or activity or star? Uh, I like I like to watch um, soccer. Oh, you do like to watch soccer? Wow. Do you play? I play it a little bit. That is so cool. <laughs> you, wow. I like to play tennis. Oh, okay. Any favorite tennis ten, tennis players? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Serena Williams, maybe. Serena, I, I figured she'd come out. Yeah. I have to admit, all over the world, I was in Botswana in Southern Africa. And I'll never forget, I was at the bishop's house and um, uh, I forgot who was playing soccer in England. There was a, 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 I don't remember. But anyway, somebody was playing and we sat up and watched soccer. I mean, all night long, sat up and watched soccer. And I actually, he helped me learn how to watch it. Um, it's a, it, it, that's the, the, it's the largest game in the world. They play soccer everywhere you go around the world. Now my serious. Like, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say I like watching WWE. Oh, you like the WWE? Right. Excellent. <laughs> That's right. Is that the World Wrestling Association? No, World Wrestling Entertainment. Oh, OK. Oh, that's good. <laughs> You like, you're the wrestler, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Now I got the serious point. Yeah. Here's the serious. What would you like to be when you grow up? I really would like to be a wrestler. 
Because um, I've heard lots of documentaries and um, they like gave me like they like inspired me like uh-huh. a lot of wrestlers. They inspire me to do what they do. I mean, it might be hard, but I might learn it a lot. Uh-huh. Yeah, I already I already know some moves because I do some in my bed sometimes. You wrestle in your bed. That's good. OK. All right. <laughs> That's great. How about your other guys? I want to be a singer, a musician, and an actress. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. You go for it. Um, <clears throat> um, I don't really like know what I want to be, but like one thing that I've thought of is being a basketball player. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> When I grow up, I think I might want to be a marine biologist because I like studying like and mammals that live in the water. And I've been interested since I was little. I'll be there. That's wonderful. Well, you dream. Don't don't give up the dream. And what you'll do something, because if you dream, you're gonna do something. And you just do it and just know, like you learn in, in this school, this remarkable school. God loves you, and God puts you here, and and uh, you do whatever you can and whatever you dream, and like all the partners for St. James School, you do your part to help this world be a little bit better than it was. God bless you guys. Thank you, Bishop Curry. We're going to turn it back over to Mr. Kasovich now. That was great. Let's let's uh, we have a lot of folks virtually at home and in your offices. Let's give our students some snaps and some claps and <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes. Well, that was a lot of fun and 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 thank you, students, for being here tonight and extending your day. Um, Bishop Curry, we're going to end soon. Bishop Gutierrez will will lead us with prayer. But but before you go. I want to extend a word of gratitude to you for your commitment to this work at St. James School all across the country. As you and I talked about several months ago, we have a wonderful, blessed network of Episcopal urban schools across the country that are doing this work. And thank you on behalf of all of our schools, but especially St. James, thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your presence here tonight and for reminding us that we are already following Jesus Christ and that we are already doing the work and there's so much more to do, but the importance of of one child, one family, and one brother and sister at a time. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Also, I I have some news for you and uh, it's hot off the press. You may remember about a month ago when I talked to you, I you, you asked about what St. James School is up to these days. And we are uh, at the tail end of our Reach and Sustain campaign. And the campaign is to raise funds to start an endowment for St. James School, but also to build a new addition, a new building that's gonna attach to the existing schoolhouse. Bishop Curry, I have some news for you. A family here in this diocese, the Diocese of Pennsylvania, a family that would rather remain anonymous, they're very humble, they have committed $500,000 to the building project. And they've asked that the the gift be given in your name. And they've asked specifically that we name one of our classrooms, the Bishop Michael Curry classroom. So I wanna share that news with you and um, thank you. Thank, Thank you and please thank them. Oh my Lord. Yes, yes. So um, it's such good news uh, on on this day. So thank you again for being here. And before we uh, end with our benediction, um, I do want everyone who's watching to make sure that you have, hopefully you, you do, this date on your calendar. So we, our final event of our, of our 10 year anniversary is coming up just around the corner. So please mark your calendar for Thursday, June 3rd. That is the event that we will close out our 10-year anniversary. And if you haven't heard, 
we have Kristen Welker will serve as our MC, the uh, White House correspondent with NBC. We're so excited to have her back and to have her back in Philadelphia. So please join us for that event. So that ends our event for tonight. I wanna hand it over to our Bishop, Bishop Daniel Gutierrez, who will lead us in our benediction. Bishop. And thank you once again, Bishop Curry. God of hope, mercy and love, as the sun sets on this joyous night, we ask for your blessing on all your beloved children in this world. Blessings upon all the partners of St. James who have supported this ministry for the past 10 years and their continued support for the next 100 years. Your blessing upon this beautiful diocese and her people, upon Michael, our presiding bishop. And we ask for your special blessings upon the students, the teachers, the staff, families, and the surrounding community. Their hearts, their minds bring about the transformation that our world desperately needs. And in following you, you have taught us about the beauty of community, to embrace the beautiful in the sacred present. Tonight, we have captured all that is beautiful in you and in one another. We ask all these blessings in the name of your Son, our Savior, Lord, and Redeemer. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you and all those you love this day and forevermore. Thank you, Bishop Gutierrez. And as always, thank you for your loving care and passion for the work here on Clearfield Street. It's always good to see you. And we're looking forward to having you back in person here uh, on Clearfield Street. So as we close, um, you've heard a little bit about uh, this building and this campaign that we're in, and many of you know about it. Two weeks ago now, we announced the big news. But if you haven't heard about it, I invite you to stay for the last four minutes as we share a special video announcing our new building and the final stages of our Reach and Sustain campaign. So enjoy the video. Thank you for joining us and happy 10 year anniversary. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We have been blessed with your presence. Thank you. Have you heard? St. James School is celebrating 10 years of breaking new ground in urban education. My name is Tyne Drain and I am a proud 2016 graduate and now a freshman at Holy Family University. I am here to share breaking news about the future of St. James School. Will you count down with me? Five, four, three, two, one, yay! This summer, we are breaking ground on a new building. Are you as excited as I am? We're not gonna let this pandemic get in the way of the needs of our students. You're the reason why we can still do this. And let me just tell you a few things that I'm excited about. Our campus will grow and so will our programs to better serve our students, our graduates, and the entire community. These steps this is a beautiful building, but it's hard for like the older seniors to be able to get in. My mother is not able to walk at all, and her dream is to be able to really come and see St. James, the inside of the school. We're in the middle of a planning phase for a, um, an adult education program that will be starting in the fall. And with your help, we will be able to bring that adult education program to life. That will serve adults 18 plus in a variety of ways. St. James is like a family. It's somewhere I could go to when I need help. So I remember in 2015 when we had our first class of graduates. We had 15 kids and they were really excited to come here and for this space to be theirs. Next year, we're gonna have 106 graduates to serve between the ages of 13 and 22. This space will not serve them. Overcrowding is a big thing here at St. James, especially in Husky Hangout. 
but this new building will alleviate the overcrowding and just have more room to do the job that we do each day. St. James is important to me because it made me who I am today. There will be a bigger science classroom and more space, and there will be a bigger maker space. This maker space will allow future engineers like me to explore, code, and build robots. Soon, our younger sisters will be able to come to St. James School. I'm excited about the new building because there's going to be a room dedicated to both music and art, which are my favorite subjects. Now you know why Tyne and I want to share this breaking news with you. I know how passionate you are about St. James, and I'm sure you have a number of questions. For example, I'm sure you're curious about whether the new building will allow us to add lower grades. The short answer is yes. Now it's an option for us. I look forward to talking to each and every one of you soon and sharing more. We've come this far, but we're bursting at the seams. Right now, we need everyone to help us build this new building and give more than we've ever given before. My prayer is every person who's part of our school will look at our new building and feel and say, I'm proud to be part of the care and community that helped build that. Will you join us in breaking new ground? Will you join us in breaking new ground? Will you join us? Will you join us? Will you join us? In breaking new ground. Breaking new ground. Will you join us in breaking new ground?